Folks, as mentioned at the top of the show, I'd like to share a little bit about my life story with you. And ever since I was a little boy, actually a small baby, I seem to have had a shining star shown over me throughout the course of my life. And by round of applause, I'd like to know how many Australians, New Zealanders, Brits and Americans we have in the room. Good, good, good. Now, I'm not trying to exclude anyone else, but the Australians, Brits, Canadians, and English, and uh, the uh, Americans, we all know the TV current affairs program, 60 Minutes, correct? Yeah. I, was for good. I was fortunate enough for them to do two documentary stories about my life story and my career some years ago. And um, I'll talk more about all this after the video. I've, I've, done, I've um, edited one of the videos down to a three minute clip to share with you, so I hope you enjoy this. It's every musician's dream to travel the world playing the great festivals. One gifted young pianist from Adelaide, Kim Perling, is about to experience all that wonder. But when Kim arrived in America this week for his first concerts, he'll attract attention not only for his talent, but also for his remarkable life story. Rebecca Bailey has more. Music is his life's passion, and hearing the jazz pianist play, it's hard to imagine life's ever been any different. But Kim's life at the keyboard is a far cry from war-torn Vietnam, where he spent the first months of his life. Like many war orphans, Kim spent his first months in institutions in Vietnam, but unlike most, he was lucky enough to be adopted in Australia, one of the first overseas adoptions here. Kim arrived in Australia after his South Australian parents spent two long years lobbying governments and aid agencies alike. I got this letter and we came home, I opened the letter and there was this photo and we had to respond about whether we wanted to get this uh, little guy to see if we were straight back. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it just just click. So where do you think the music's come from then? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's, it, that's what makes me think about my blood, my biological parents, you know, um, whether one of them was a musician and um, whether I'm actually full blood Vietnamese, I'm not sure either, you know. One of them might have been American soldier who engaged in jazz or music. <laughs> so I, I don't really know where the music came from. Maybe, you know, a lot of people that are in the artistic uh, areas, neither of their parents are artistic themselves, you know, that's an, so it's another thing altogether, so who knows, it's just a gift somehow. Two years ago, Kim's curiosity about his origins took him to Vietnam, where he introduced audiences and musicians to jazz, a sound rarely heard in the communist country. With the tour ultimately a success, Kim and his mother took some time out to visit the Ho Chi Minh City Orphanage, where his life began. While the trip didn't reveal the identity of his biological parents, it was a tangible link to his past. Obviously, it stirred some deep emotions in all of us, and especially of the um, women that were at the, orphan, uh, at the location when we were there, because they obviously remember that time when babies like myself were there in, in, that, in 73 and 72. So, but it was just very inspiring to know that um, this place is still standing, at least, and I could go back there and visit it for sentimental reasons. This month, Kim's on the move again. First to play the great jazz festivals of Europe, and then to do his master's degree in America. Opportunities he credits to growing up in Australia. Basically, I've just plucked out of a war zone and brought to one of the greatest countries to live in in the world and had a great family life and education and be able to play music now. And that's a lot of, um, better story than some other refugees can say. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be able to share that with the, the audiences on ships. And I'd like to also share the postscript of this story, and that is about two and a half years ago, I decided to do a DNA test. 
Okay, don't sound so excited. <laughs> I, I have a lot of Vietnamese friends in Vietnam and Australia and the US, and over the years, I've compared my looks to theirs, and I always thought my features were a little bit softer, the cheekbones not as pronounced, the eyes maybe. Um, and I thought, the only way now that you can do DNA is a DNA test, genetics test, is actually do one. And two and a half years ago, I had the kit sent to my mum and dad's place in South Australia when I was there on vacation. And I had to scrub the inside of my cheeks till they bled and send the swatches over to the lab in Texas. And about three months later, folks, I got my results. And this is absolutely true story. I found out that I'm 54% Chinese. Wait for it. And 46% 40, either Cambodian or Malay. No Vietnamese blood whatsoever. <laughs> That's how my family reacted and my friends. We all thought it was very strange. But about a week later, my friend Jamie calls him up and he's a very handsome looking African American Vietnamese guy and he's been looking for his parents for 15 years. So he knows a lot more about all this DNA stuff than I do. But he calls me up a week later and he says, Kim, you may not know this, and folks, this is a true story too. You may not know this, he said, but there actually is no Vietnamese gene. Everybody from Vietnam has either Chinese, Cambodian, or Malay blood, which makes me 100% Vietnamese. I'm proud of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Quite a story, right? Well, folks, um, something else I want to share with you is I get asked two questions a lot when I degree people from the showroom. So let me just put a little plug in here. After the show, I'll be standing outside the doors on deck four, that side. I'm not going to try to sell you one of my CDs or anything. I just want you to come and say hello and let me know if you enjoyed the show, okay? Okay, good, good. All right. But the two questions I get asked a lot at the showroom doors when I degreet people. The first question is, are your parents still alive? And yes, you saw mum and dad in the video. They're alive and well, living in Adelaide, South Australia still, travelling the world occasionally and just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. So I'm very proud of them. Thank you. Thank you. Now the other question I get asked a lot is, do you have any siblings? Well, I do. I have three. Mum and dad had two biological daughters of their own, homemade. Homemade daughters before they adopted me, and when Rebecca was six and Catherine was four, they adopted me. And then when I became two and a half years old, we adopted another Vietnamese war orphan who became my brother. And Michael was ten days younger than me. <laughs> and when I tell people that, they think, oh, your poor mother. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you that too. Now, with my musical life, folks, I've had the good fortune over the years to play with some of the best musicians and singers and dancers and actors. Um, in the business and uh, I'm not trying to name drop but I am actually curious to know if you know some of these great artists that I've worked with. So by round of applause, do you remember the Mills Brothers? <laughs> Paper Doll, Taxi Driver, Glowworm. I've worked with the Mills Brothers and the great Donald Mills um, just before Donald Mills passed away. And a woman had a great uh, hit called Wheel of Fortune, a woman called Kay Star. Do you remember Kay Star? <laughs> I think you Americans know Kay Star, right? Um, and another guy that most of you should know, from the Partridge family, David Cassidy. Yeah. <laughs> I worked with him in a little town called um, Las Vegas. Um, another woman that I did some television work in the US with, and I love her father's piano playing and singing immensely, um, and that's the vocalist Natalie Cole. Yeah. But the big guy, ladies and gentlemen, that I travelled around the world with for two years as his musical director and conductor and pianist was a guy by the name of Ingelbert Humperdinck. <laughs> and that's right. Pardon me. And when travelling around the world, we played in some of the world's biggest concert halls and some of the world's largest arenas. It was an amazing experience. And um, when sitting at his piano and conducting his band and listening to his anecdotes, I realised a lot of his songs about breaking up. <laughs> Lonely is a man without love. The last waltz. And of course, please release me. <laughs> Let me go, right? Well, we're not going to play any songs about breaking up, but this is a song Engelbert made very famous and popularised. This is Quando, Quando, Quando.